This is a continuation of my generic analysis of Mulholland Drive. The essentials are similar, but where my premise is that the cowboy character is a demon manifesting into this material realm, the premise regarding the Castigliani brothers is rather they are possessed humans. Either from a lack of care or knowledge, they all show disregard for common social behavior. The odd-looking cowboy in the ill-fitting clothes with an old motif and the affectation of these two regarding the dainty extended finger, the vulgar expulsion of the espresso with the other brother's nose blowing and screaming. Seemingly, they at least go through the motions as lawyers or businessmen in other meetings with the same kinds of weird reactions to the espresso, the requirement for the napkin, etc., in the scene, the studio reps are clearly on edge and have already chosen a different espresso, coordinated with the waiter, based on similar negative responses in the past. Let me lay out my points or aspects to consider. One is in regard to the dream logic of the story and how this fits with the concept of possession, and then the implication these are simply mobsters. In regard to the director being cut off from the money, I will put forward some thoughts that look deeper. The idea of this story is a dream, or part of a dream, is missing information regarding our minds or spirits. Or to give credence to what's been memorialized, they are essentially the same, meaning the mind equals spirit. In other words, no thoughts or memories reside or are stored in our brains, and we should think of our brains as nothing more than receivers and transmitters. Mechanically, then, if our brains are damaged, then like a broken radio, it won't receive or transmit all available stations, so to speak, as they are being broadcast. And meanwhile, if you open that radio, there's just parts and not the source of sounds. The idea then is that our thoughts and memories are subject to external input, where essentially each person's mind slash spirit is unique in the same way each smartphone has a unique identifier number to make and send or receive signals. Or consider all our thoughts and memories or our unique character slash mind spirit is maintained overall or stored in an external drive of, of sorts, something like cloud storage. Our spirit mind, as of now, has a requirement for a body or container that in turn has metabolism, i.e. life. So when we die, or for instance are under anesthesia, we lose access to our spirit while it resides from its last point of awareness on that external cloud storage. Hence, when one comes out of a coma or anesthesia, there is no memory beyond the moment of total unconsciousness or loss of life, the cessation of metabolism and breath. How does this relate to dreams or the dream premise of this story? Well, if there are no thoughts or memories in our brain, transmitting and receiving, and our thoughts are based on external input, and when we are asleep, we are essentially cut off from visual and most auditory input, means or implies that dreams are direct inputs by an external force, source, or entity. We are in a vulnerable state when we sleep, and this makes it easier for our minds, spirits to be hacked or tapped. If we consider a source of water and choices, where the choices are a clear mountain spring, a brown muddy river or a puddle on the side of the road to represent sources of inf information, then I would like to suggest one consider that many pagan or backward country bumpkin uneducated people put a lot of emphasis on dreams and dream analysis and to rather consider that this is a form of a prank on humanity to try and understand what is essentially a random or under generic design i.e. common or meaningless, input into our minds to generally mess with us that we call dreams. Can some dreams represent high-level sources of knowledge or information as a direct download from a more intelligent and powerful entity? Sure, but typically most of humanity are getting dreams from the boys in the mailroom, if you get the drift of what I mean.
It's interesting that folklore have examples of deities that are responsible for nightmares. For example, in Germanic folklore, there are mares or mare, which is a malicious entity that rides on people's chest while they sleep, bringing that person a bad dream, often along with a physical feeling of helplessness. We, in our sophistication, would say that is simply a way to explain something like sleep paralysis. The concept of a malicious entity entering one's sleeping space to cause nightmares is established in numerous cultures around the globe. How would this technically work under a state of possession? Well, it would strongly imply that when a separate entity takes possession of someone's mind-spirit, that person's own mind-spirit is shunted and put into sleep mode, or an inactive file, sort of like when a person is under anesthesia. This is why people don't know what happened when they come back or their mind-spirit is taken out of that sleep mode. As a side note, we can see it's quite plausible the general public is being taken for a ride regarding transhumanism because our minds, spirits reside outside our bodies, brains, and therefore are outside our control and therefore cannot be transferred into a machine. In theory, an external spirit or entity, call it a deity, a god, or a demon, could go into a machine, but why would an intangible spirit being want to go into a machine with no heart, emotions, or senses, touch, taste, etc.? So the movie's dream concept is correct to a degree, but if what I put forward is included, then it actually goes beyond that to tie together it being a dream with human possession, which is essentially like a waking dream where a separate entity is inputting thoughts into the mind-spirit of the person via their mechanical transmitting and receiving brain. Why do I say the idea the director and studio are dealing with mobsters is a ruse or feint? For one, because the mafia are controlled or managed. No way do the powerful and ancient aristocratic families with their ties to government, the intelligence agencies, etc., and the largest banks sit back while some upstart crime families run something as crucial as Hollywood. If anything, it goes with what I noted in my Kingsman video, how even your typical chief of police learned to keep an eye on the gambling houses and brothels to manage human vice and develop leverage so as to call in favors or crack down on certain players to prevent too much blatant crime or vice and to ensure the flow of commerce. Within the overall scope of human vice, the aristocrats have institutions under a shared mindset to control the big picture. So why would they care about an individual or crime family grabbing localized opportunities? The mob provide plausible deniability and a way to work outside official channels along with options. Secondly, they wield too much fear to just be the mob. Everyone in the room is freaked out except for the director. So why doesn't he know how powerful these two guys are? And then along that line, why would any studio work with them based on them being so vulgar and creepy, unless, of course, they represent something very sinister and powerful? We are to believe the mafia is so powerful, a couple middle-aged lawyers, businessmen, with paunches, not only freak out the old studio guy who's clearly survived in Hollywood for years, but also can dictate to every Hollywood studio, since if they couldn't or didn't, the project would just be moved to another studio, a different producer, a different director, whatever, away from these brothers' control. This is saying it goes beyond basic commerce, where they are pushing for this particular actress for a spiritual reason or a reason that goes or exists far beyond our silly little reality of mansions, luxury cars, and status. The old studio guy tries to play it cool, but his younger associate is clearly on edge and mainly about the espresso. It's basically inferred they will promote that particular actress, this is the girl, and if need be will go along to replace the director if they should balk, but they are worried about whether or not the espresso will be accepted as if that alone could end their careers or threaten their lives? Why the espresso? 
Similar to the cowboy choosing 40s or 50s western wear, this demon spirit is obsessed with the idea of being a coffee snob, or they experienced espresso they liked while in a material body and refuse anything less than that. Their attempt at being fully human, experiencing taste, etc., but their lack of human empathy or feelings based on one being born of a woman drives them to vulgarity and single-mindedness, their way, nothing else, and otherwise derision, disgust, or anger towards people who they really have little in common. For the second brother, their affectation or display goes directly to those latter negative expressions, and hence the base, simplistic expression or release to nastily and loudly blow their nose. There is a similar red herring, which implies the mafia connection relating to the old man in a wheelchair monitoring the meeting from a hidden away room. He's like the old guard assigned to monitor and control aspects of Hollywood while reporting to and taking orders from the aristocratic class, which in turn is in league with spiritual beings. He's powerful, but he's not high enough in their hierarchy to just enjoy wealth and a life of leisure. He's also so critical to their operations, they don't let him fully retire, even when he's old and confined to a wheelchair. Too much is at stake, requiring him to be nearby and hands-on, even if he can remain in the shadows overall. I would liken him to a crown agent who's been granted certain rights and privileges not granted to a commoner, i.e. citizen, voter, resident, as long as he fulfills the duties and responsibilities he's sworn to uphold. It would seem in their hierarchy the demonically possessed Castigliani brothers are able to follow through on a threat and can influence most or all of the studios, but are also required to be directly involved, e.g. attend meetings, go to parties. The old man in the wheelchair can remain hidden and is seemingly higher and is given greater access to current and future plans or planning, but is still below the actual aristocrats who just get reports from and give instructions to him. Something like the true aristocrats he reports to are the dukes and earls. He is likely of a lower level, but still higher than a common pleb, worker, knave, or citizen. Something like a knight, esquire, or gentleman. The latter has a descriptive meaning of a person's character and qualities, but also can be a wealthy man who does not engage in menial occupation or in manual labor for gain, per Webster's definition. After the director refuses, he discovers he's been cut off from what he thinks is money. What he really had were bookkeeping entries or ones and zeros portraying a number in an account assigned to his name and TIN number or tax identification number. Since there was no actual money, that number was revised or deleted, causing him to be instantly broke. You're broke. Yeah, but I'm not broke. I know, but you're broke. First, there is no money, and there really is no debt, but rather what we operate under or have is credit. Consider if something is a promise and it's never fulfilled, then it's really no promise at all. If I promise to come over and mow your lawn and I never do it, was it really a promise? Secondly, if money is debt, then how can a debt be paid by or with more debt? Negotiable instrument is a promise to pay a fixed amount of money. And it circles back since negotiable instruments called notes or currency were issued by a private corporation. So a negotiable instrument or note is supposed to be money when the negotiable instrument is meant to be an order or promise to pay with money. Do you see how it circles back on itself? The negotiable instrument is a promise to pay money, and yet what we call money is itself a negotiable instrument. Really, then, those notes or money represent a canceled check on a closed account. This is an important reason why cash is no longer promoted and rather the use of debit and credit cards and associated bookkeeping entries or ones and zeros on networks because who would want to have too many canceled checks on closed accounts in their possession? So it is actually a Star Trek utopian reality based on the instant creation of credit and then the use or assignment of credit 
the noted ones and zeros, or a number in an account. The issue is because the public neither cares to press this issue, nor is mature enough to use their credit wisely. The system rightfully, overall, deceives said public into believing there is money and debt. Just consider how many of your neighbors would go buy three or four luxury cars or two or three homes or would leave the water running and their lights on all day if they knew they essentially had potential access legally to endless credit or let's say millions of dollars in credit. Also, what better way to prove that humanity is undeserving than to prove their love of money when they fight, cheat, lie, and steal over something that doesn't even exist? The Wizarding World of Harry Potter reveals this separation between us and them, i.e. the nobility, because consider how the tenured wizarding families work with tangible money in the form of gold and silver coins that are kept in personal vaults. The director in the movie is just a pleb like most of us, but at least if they had gold or silver in a high quality vault or safe, the mobsters or powers that be would have had to work harder to cut him off from his wealth. We can get into this in greater depth, but really the public are muggles who operate in, in ignorance, while the wizards are really the aristocrats who operate within the same overall system of courts, contracts, and procedures, but are granted different privileges or rights than us. Note the John Wick movies also show or reveal this kind of separation and the use of tangible gold and silver currency. So what is this debt we are told about? Consider it in this way. Let's say someone asks you to watch their $250,000 supercar while they are away for a few months. You'd have a big problem on your hands because if that car is damaged while it's in your care, you are liable. And how are you going to afford to repair or replace that car? So you would put that car into proper storage and probably also get insurance to cover potential damage while it's under your care. That's the debt. Basically, every time there is a transaction, the credit or money is created on the spot using the person's name and TIN or tax identification number with associated transaction numbers given to them, meaning to banks and businesses. But because technically this credit belongs to that person or all those millions of people creating and participating in transactions, it's like that supercar in someone else's other than the actual owner's hands and can say then the Fed or central bank for the particular district is responsible until that credit is given back or used. And because that number is extremely large and increasing, they have to keep increasing the amount of insurance they maintain in the same way one would need so much insurance to keep a $250,000 supercar in their care, but would need even more insurance for two or three or four more $250,000 supercars in their care. Every time someone uses their debit card, that transaction is tied to their implied or account setup signature tied to their name and TIN, and that creates the money or issue of credit. And so if you consider all the transactions that take place every hour of every day above and beyond bank loans, and it's no wonder the so-called debt is growing by leaps and bounds. The director got direct feedback that when one participates in using the Crown's infrastructure, the roads, the currency, promissory notes, granted by said crown, then any gains are subject to a tax or fee for the privilege of using what the crown provides. Or it can say if something is not really yours, is it uncommon to be asked to pay a fee for the privilege to use that thing, where in this extreme response or reaction, the fee was all the credit or money in the director's accounts. For those thinking their nation became independent, consider the following wording in various treaties, acts, or charters. No law impairing obligation of a contract. No charter or grant or pardon granted before the date of the stated act being implemented shall be any ways impeached or invalidated by 
this current act, but that the same shall be and remain of the same force and effect in law, and no other than as if this act had never been made. This is stating that the creation of any current new act, charter, or contract cannot impair the financial obligation of past, previous, charters, treaties, or contracts, etc., where those previous contracts remain of the same force and effect in law as if that current or new treaty or contract, etc., had never been made. So you have party one and party two as the two parties of some contract, where one, no third party can break that contract between the original parties, and two, where if there are successors or heirs in continuation from party one and two, that contract shall remain in full force and effect for centuries upon centuries. Yes, the contract may be amended, but not to impair the financial obligations of the parties who made the contract. That amendment may include a change in rights or privileges for certain groups, or it may create a change in definition, e.g. slave, citizen, resident, colony, or state, but it will not change the financial obligations. So really, we like the director in this story, or his manager, or the studio reps, or even the old man in the wheelchair, are subject to covenants or contracts and charters that go back centuries, if not millennia. To be fair, it generally makes sense, since to have trust and order and stability, the people coming together to form a contract would state the contract binds the parties currently and their successors not to act counter to the terms in the contract, where the obligations of the charter or contract shall always remain firm since otherwise faith would be lost by successors or third parties seeking to invalidate the previous charter or contract with their current new charter or contract. And now chaos and disorder can ensue because that trust or faith is lost, damaged, or lessened, and that could adversely affect the stable flow of commerce. There is a curious aspect of force or warfare for cases when contractual obligations are not fulfilled by a party or parties, where legal authority may not be sufficient to convince that party or parties, and therefore force is required to basically remind them of their duties and obligations. But even when force or war is required, note it always falls back on international law, which in turn leads to treaties or contracts that circle around to reinforce the original obligations from the previous contract or contracts. This is why those who try to operate outside international law and specifically of equity and commerce are savagely attacked and soundly defeated. I'm straying too far a bit too fast, but briefly consider the following sequence and thank you for your patience and hopefully the work you put into this expanded thought exercise, which hopefully allows you to see this reality in a new light. To summarize, in sequence, point one, so-called opposing sides or separation of power is allowed to add legitimacy when there is no actual opposing side. Consider the concept that the King of Britain was allowed to maintain their specific rights, regalia, and liberties so as to fulfill the requirement for legitimacy in something like a second witness when necessary. Point two, this would pertain to the actual crown being in control of the war between the American colonies and Britain, the monarchy, where true power was lost to this actual crown where the crown monarch only retained those certain rights and liberties along with their regalia, i.e. the pomp and circumstance. Point three, tying points one and two together means essentially the king was allowed a degree of authority so as to act as a second witness or the official who could recognize the newly independent United States, even though in practice or under the financial obligations he as monarch and the colonial representatives were bound as successors and heirs by previous charters, grants, or contracts. 
Basically, they could not demand or grant what was not theirs. Point four. Technically, the king's recognition of the United States was redundant or pointless since members of the actual crown signed as both parties to the treaty between the U.S. and Britain. And since the same party cannot sign as both Party 1 and Party 2, essentially means this agreement was nothing more than an internal memo or internal change, i.e. it amended titles, rights or definitions and terms, but did not invalidate nor could it impair the previously agreed upon financial obligations, which were owed to the monarchy crown and then to the actual crown. Point five, or think of it like this, this unifying mindset doesn't prevail in every person's mind all the time. So besides the reason seeming opposing offices or officers are maintained to give the necessary image that rules are being followed or that the pejorative they have to follow their own procedures to maintain the noted stability and order, there is a second reason based on some in positions of authority disagreeing at the wrong place or time. A possible example is where the newly independent colonies or states wanted to amend the Constitution to prevent people getting positions in government who held titles of nobility from foreign nations. Now these Americans are working within the stated procedures, and yet this could cause a problem for crown agents holding titles of nobility from retaining citizenship, making them incapable of gaining office in the U.S. to influence U.S. policies. This then would be a case for war or the noted force to rapidly shut down that possibility in the short term and hence a potential case for the War of 1812, where British troops can destroy key documents in DC and sow enough destruction and confusion that amendment is put on hold until enough see the value in allowing government officers to hold titles of nobility from foreign nations where they now see the benefit in the expansion and maintenance of the crown interest.